Hi, Abhi. Can you hear my voice properly? Yes. Uh, okay, great. But not able to see. Yes, I can see you also. So we'll just start in, in a couple of minutes. Sorry. Oh, no problems. Love your background better. <laughs> I'm assuming I had to... your creation. <laughs> no, I had to really do a bad job. Maybe I'll show a sketchbook in the meanwhile. Oh, that's great. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, is this something you've done recently? So I volunteer with the elephants. I work with the elephants. And this is uh, during the break time. I. Uh, you know, sort of sketch them. But uh, mostly the work is about feeding them because an elephant eats about 150, 200 kgs of food every day. So right. we are mostly making breakfast for them and then cleaning their enclosures, picking up their uh, remain, you know, oh. remain food. Yeah. <laughs> and then taking them out on a walk as well. It's, it's, it's very humbling. Uh, but so in between when I get little time, uh, I, I do the sketches. This is of the bears as well. We, so I thought while we start, I can always. Uh, no, no, I'm, and people are anyway messaging that they like it. Yeah. Awesome. And this is a, uh, so the, these are two elephants. One, uh, uh, one, uh, one name, uh, uh, one's name is Susie and mm -hmm. she's blind. She's about 60, okay. 65 years old. And her okay. name, and her friend is Asha. And uh, Susie and Asha, you know, so Susie follows Asha and she also mm -hmm. can follow, follow music. She worked in a circus and was rescued. And they have two caretakers. One is uh, Babu Lalji and the mm -hmm. other is Chacha. We just call him Chacha. And one is a Hindu and one is a Muslim. And they are connected, you know, by through the elephants. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. fantastic uh, a real story. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And Chacha recently passed away, uh, that said. And... Uh, he, he the only last thing he wanted to know if his elephants are going out on a walk and are being fed properly. So these mm -hmm. are the two elephants, Susie and Asha. So Susie means a flower. Mm -hmm. And these are all in the break time uh, when we are not sort of working uh, because mostly it's, as I said, it's basically a more service driven uh, you know, experience and not so much that you have to make a project out of it or something. So this is right. just between. Uh... Oh. Oh, so and, and by so... the way, Rajni or Prabir, let me know uh, if we are good to go because I think we have to start on time. So Rajni, do let us know when we are all ready. Karthik, is Anjum online? Uh, no, I think she will join by uh, half past seven. <laughs> She'll join after 7.30? At 7.30, that's when is her session, right? Okay, perfect. So I think we can start then.
Okay. Uh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to to another edition of of IMA Young Leader Council sessions. We do, and we are also proud to have BML Munjal University as our online partner. And uh, today's session is an extremely interesting one uh, to me personally as well because uh, I believe we have had so many sessions over the last few weeks. There, there has been like sort of a race of webinars, if you will, which is happening around the world. But you know, most of them, if you realize, are all specifically focused on you know management, economy, growth rate, all those cookie cutter stuff which we have also gotten bored of, uh, you know, discussing and and overfilling with the numbers. So I thought uh, let us have a completely different sort of a session in which, and as you can see, the title of the session is Different Strokes, and the idea is that can we look for inspiration outside the corporate boardrooms? And actually, see uh, some of the amazing work people are doing uh, outside our box. Thinking of what a typical meaning of management innovation is, and uh, you know, we've got two sessions today. The first one uh, is with uh, Abhishek Singh, and the second with Anjum Chopra. So, if I talk about the first session uh, with with Abhishek, and I'll uh, take the liberty of calling him Abhi, as I know he likes to be called. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Uh, storytelling we abhi and just for your background also a lot of people are talking about that you know the entire uh, you know if you make a product or you do some innovation it's all about storytelling people are learning this skill as corporate leaders as ceos also and you know every product or every innovation has to tell a story so storytelling is at heart of what everybody is, is aspiring to do and you know when we talk about innovation i think it starts from the basic uh, curiosity and creativity and that's what sort of uh, you know anticipates into a into a outlet which could be a product which could be a service which could be any execution with that uh, background in mind you know we we thought uh, who better than than somebody who's got a mix of creativity and artistic background to sort of share his his learnings with us and we can imbibe Some of those learnings into what we do in our daily life. So, guys, we are very lucky to have uh, a renowned artist with us today, uh, Abhishek. And I also thank our uh, YLC member uh, Anwar to to bring him on board. And just a quick few words about uh, Abhi, and I also will share some of his work. So we have some background. You know, Abhi is a is an acclaimed graphic novelist uh, who is known for his unique interpretation of myths and ancient philosophy. instigating environmental themes universal identities and spiritual oneness he is the writer and illustrator of graphic novel krishna a journey within which we will also see shortly which is published by uh, image comics he is also the first indian descent uh, creator to be published by them in the history of north american comic books he was also the illustrator for the ramayana 3392 ad and indian authentic comics his paintings drawings and digital works uh you know have been featured in in lot of exhibitions in los angeles county museum of art lacma he also made recently a which is a very first for an artist i have heard of he is making a virtual reality film which he did for deepak chopra and this film sort of explores vr as a therapeutic platform of the future where conventional medicine can be substituted with immersive experiences so i'll also guys show you a quick video of uh, the krishna uh, comic which he developed and that will probably give you some sense of uh, you know what he does i hope uh, can everybody see us are you can see yes
also have a couple of his creations uh, guys which are also in a couple of minutes i'll show you and maybe abhi will uh, in a few minutes also describe some of these uh, for us he recently also came up uh, with the book nama and he'll also share with us the story behind it but uh, and you know with this obviously a, a very warm welcome uh, abhi to to our show with aima we are really pleased to have you with us and i'm going to keep uh, drawing some parallels with what we do in our management so as to you know some of our audience members can also relate to what you have done in your area of expertise how that thing sort of learnings can can be embedded in what they do so my first uh, you know sort of uh, question to you is uh, why are you not in movies you're so handsome <laughs> just kidding <laughs> no, and you can a... answer that as well but on a serious note you know a lot of people in 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 our management abhi we all talk about uh, you know how we need to wear multiple hats and with this corona pandemic coming in people talk about how you need to upskill yourself how you need to diversify your portfolio and i think you are a perfect example because you are an artist as well you are a graphic novelist as well you are in a in a many ways a creator illustrator you are also doing full blown production like we saw the videos so i think that's a very interesting uh, sort of a innovation in your field of work where people are generally very specific or very wedded to their thought process that this is what i do and i do it really well and i think you in many ways have uh, been a torch bearer of this new age uh, artist who have actually learned all these different sort of skills and have curated this to deliver a end to end experience to the end consumer so tell us a little bit about about your journey and how this whole thought process came in where you started to do so many interesting things together and i also want to know from you that was it were you always creative uh, since your early childhood days or is it something you picked up uh, that you had a passion for this and is it a skill uh, is creativity a skill which can be developed and honed or is it like you know some people say it's a god's gift or a blessing and you know either you have it or you don't what is your take on that abhi now let's start from uh, the the last uh, let's uh, continue the strand from where you left um i think most children are creative inherently innately i think children are driven driven by uh, innate forces which means very intrinsic kind of intuitive forces drive children uh it's so most of them are creative and creativity sort of means that when you are not letting the pressures of the world or certain condition conditionness of the world sort of uh come in the way of you expressing yourself so children don't mind you know going and playing in the mud or dancing in a crazy way or you know role playing the kind of stories they love uh, so i think most children are creative and they are but they are innately uh, intuitive uh, which means that maybe they they don't they at that stage don't have the awareness of mm. in what sense they are imaginative and that is the journey you get on when you you know you become aware of the fact that okay i i love drawing or i like to listen to stories that is the first time you become aware of something you like and then becomes the you know phase of you know trying to pursue it and perhaps fighting with the world in order to keep it also mm. uh so the question becomes uh, would you be still creative at 40 because all children right. by nature are creative but then life happens and then you go through all those different phases do you remain creative at that you know at an older age and you do you keep pursuing the thing you love you know as you grow older uh and uh, the way out of that to to keep creativity uh, as you grow you know older or in different phases of your life is to is not to see it separately is not to see it separately as just part of maybe making drawing or music but creativity as a phenomena creativity as a philosophy which you can integrate in every aspect of your life you know yeah. uh the way you deal with your children or the way you deal with with your employees or the day the way you deal with your own self you know the day let's say you're having a bad day and what you tell yourself by the end of it is also a story you know it's sort of a mm. psychological yarn a psychological thing you tell yourself in your mind which uplifts your spirit which kind of lifts you up a little bit so you have this you know relationship with yourself with all these different voices in your mind but you choose one of those voices to kind of guide the other voices on that day when you're having a bad day so that process is very much like telling a story and uh, retaining creativity and integrating that into every aspect of your of your life 
so if we look deeply into this aspect of how do you integrate, like what does it even mean to integrate creativity in your life? Say, if you look at a story, a story has aspects of, every story will have an aspect of uncertainty in it. Every story right. is built around a certain conflict. You can take any story from mythology to a folk tale to a Bollywood story. Uh, it would have a central conflict. And then there is, a, there is a pursuit to solve that conflict. Mm -hmm. But before you solve it, you may have to learn certain things so you can solve that conflict. So you have to raise yourself to the task. You know, this, that's the right. journey of the hero. That's the journey of the person who's taking the responsibility to, let's say, you know, fight with the uh, fight with these people who are attacking the villages and safeguard the villages, you know, villagers. But he does not know how to fight with a sword or use a gun or, or he does not know strategy. So he has to become, he has to find teachers who he can learn from. So raising right. yourself to the task and then eventually maybe uh, resolving that conflict. So that's the phenomenon of story in a nutshell. And I think you can apply it and integrate it in, in every aspect of your life. Um, for instance, like another example of uh, storytelling would be when you see a film, you're crying, looking at what's happening to the family of the hero, mom's mm -hmm. being kidnapped, and that's a very, you know, you are completely, you know, immersed mm -hmm. in it, and you're, and you're, you're having a physiological reaction to something, you know, music is playing, this is, you, you're feeling all kinds of emotions of patriotism, and the fight is happening at the border, and you're cheering for your team, so you're feeling this great rush of emotions. And you kind of forget that what you are, what that thing which you are, you know, experiencing is not real. It's completely fictional, yeah. right? It's completely yeah. fictional, but you're having this very strong physiological reaction. You're crying, you're laughing, or whatever it, it, it is. And the same day, you read that there was there was a tsunami in Japan, and so many people died. And perhaps your perhaps our reaction wasn't as dramatic as it was when we watched the movie. You know. Right. You know, because we are not corresponding in an immersive way to that tragedy. But if mm. the same night you see something in the news and you see the footage of that thing, you know, people, uh, people's house being destroyed, suddenly it affects you differently. So uh, that's why the way you tell a story becomes important. That's where I was wanting to come. The, so everything is a story for sure, but the act of integrating it into your life, that's deliberate. That's not gonna right. happen on its own. You have to make the effort. And also to tell the story is a deliberate act. It's not going to just happen naturally. Uh, it's got its own structure. It's got its own, uh, own ways, its own design in the manner you learn it. And then you tell the story to someone. Uh, so this is where now we can get into some of the, let's say the ancient stories or one of my interests had been to understand the effects of a story on a culture. So I'll give you an example that, you know, I'll take you to the Rajya Sabha of the Kauravas where Krishna is mm -hmm. coming in as a Shanti Dut. And right. so he's saying something, right. Uh, he's saying that don't fight, basically. In essence, that's what he's saying, that let's avert the war. It does not bring anyone any good. Just give these right. five people five villages and sort the matter out. But the other guy, Duryodhana, if you just analyze his character for a while, he goes to the gym so he's he's a good looking guy he has he's got the money he's well traveled he speaks fluently uh he's pa he's got affluent family he also knows that this person is saying something morally correct that actually war will create a lot of bad collateral damage and he also knows that this person is wise and he maybe if not god is definitely someone who is very intellectual and he's he's one of those enlightened people he knows right. all these things. He has all these things, but yet he f chooses to fight. So the question becomes, what is that in him which defeats his education, which defeats his common sense, which defeats his every other analytical ability, and he gives into this darkness of making a war happen, and everyone dies by the end of it. In the Mahabharata war, the tragedy is never been shown to us as a tragedy. It's been shown to us some kind of a light and sound dance sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the truth of the truth of that story is when you read Val, uh, when you read uh, Ved Vyasa's version that mm -hmm. five generations fight that war and all of them die by the end of it. All these people mm -hmm. like Arjuna, Bhim, and Duryodhan they're about 55 to 60, 45 year old around that time, mm -hmm. and they see their children and grandchildren mutilated and 
dying in the most barbaric way in front of them. So it's a, it's a probably one of the longest, biggest tragedy as a story. Uh, mm. So the contemplation suddenly becomes that if that story is told to us, have we learned from it? Or in what sense it has influenced a culture? So when you look at India, it is brother against a brother. Right. And at the same time, we will not listen to the thousands and thousands and years old wisdom culture in which we have. We have this beautiful wisdom literature in India, ranging from the Vedas to the Upanishads to the Puranas, mm. and so many other secular you know, uh, Ved uh, wisdom schools, be it from other Abrahamic religions or from folklore, for that matter of fact, from uh, indigenous uh, wisdom schools. So we have this treasure trove of wisdom, which we, which we have, but we will not listen to it. And it's brother pitting versus a brother in India. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can almost see if you you can see that all the society is a reflection of that story. And if you tell a different story to the society, if you tell a different story to a cluster of people, they would behave differently in that manner. So I'll give you another example and we'll come back to this phenomena. Uh, you, if, have you have you guys seen Finding Nemo, the Pixar yes. movie? Yes. So Finding Nemo is about a father clownfish going and saving his son from an aquarium, right? Yeah. That's the story in a nutshell. Yeah. And when the story came out, what happened after this? What was the effects of the story? When people loved the story, what did they do? They went and bought clownfish and put it in the aquarium. Right. And there were so many clownfish poached from all kinds of different coral parts of the sea that in a mu if you go to the natural history history museum in dc you go there and this kid yeah. is looking at this clownfish in an aquarium and saying that's mm. Nemo. Mm. and and that's the tragedy of the way sometimes human beings perceive moralistic stories you know so what is there in us which completely gets it wrong or where did we go wrong that becomes a question and this contemplation becomes part of some of these epic stories that's why you write you write stories because what happens in real life you perhaps may not have a chance to uh, resolve a conflict. But in a story, right. you're giving yourself a, some scope, at least. At least you can tell the other generation, uh, mm -hmm. the next generation after you, how to resolve these issues, how to, how to combat these things. You know? So what the first generation will learn, the second generation will evolve, and the third generation will probably live off the first two generations in terms right. of wisdom. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's interesting how you, all these bigger, larger stories are telling us these lessons of how to conduct ourselves when we have become, when hu humanity has kind of expanded in clusters of societies and cultures and multidimensionality has become part of us, technology has become part of us. So we all have become part of many worlds at the same time. So how do you bring all this multiplicity together and make sense of it? So to align things together from, from things which are maybe even conflicting to each other and finding a sense of harmony in that, in some way, that's an exercise of creativity. That's an exercise of storytelling. No, well, that's, that's uh, very uh, insightful, uh, Abhi. And, and I think we can all draw many parallels of some of these stories which you mentioned, even in our work life, not necessarily uh, you right. know, on a geopolitical level, but in our daily lives, we keep encountering uh, Duryodhans and Arjuns in our workplaces, I'm sure <laughs> many people- No, absolutely. Them. The person who gives the best excuse gets the holiday now. So <laughs> <laughs> you, if you're more convincing, if you're more, more believable, uh, right. you will influence the other person. That's the power of the word, you know, the power of the word that it manifests a certain reaction. Uh, and that's why uh, all the chants, some of those old literature stress a great mm -hmm. deal about the spoken word because it can influence the other person. There are science right. fiction stories like Dune where they actually say in the future, there are people who speak in a way which can totally influence you. Like by the end of it, a war has happened because of some random speech in a cafe. You know, right. a world war happened because someone gave some kind of a volatile speech about something and people said, man, that guy's a point. And next thing you know, it's, you know, concentration camps and a world war breaks out on the world. But it all starts from that one word which influences the mind and just takes over. But what is it taking over is the contemplation. It's not just mere word. Where it is coming from, what is that hmm. sense tendency? What is that tendency in you which is manifesting the word? And what tendency is there in the other person which is receiving it and, and giving you that reaction? So a lot of this, right. at what is happening to a person at a deeper level, the unconscious bits of it, how you're conditioned at an unconscious level or what is the design of human beings that say, what's the design of the mind? 
some of the, these things you are trying to discover, maybe you're trying to look for them in these older stories. Like I'll give you another, another example when uh, people say Tantra mm -hmm. or yoga. So yeah. yoga comes from an ancient word, uh, yuj, which means just to align. Uh, okay. Tantra also comes from, uh, it's a combination of two words, tra means a tool. So your pen is a tool as well, or right. you know, whatever you use, a device. And mm -hmm. tan means to loom, to align something, to bring, to bring many things together, many ecosystems together, perhaps many elements together. Mm -hmm. uh, but so what are we bringing together? What are we aligning? So you have 12 systems in your body from nervous system to cardiovascular system to endocrine system, which is your glandular system. Right. And you have these sort of 11, 12 systems layers to your body you can look at it like an untuned guitar or an untuned instrument mm -hmm. and you're trying to align this and then when you play this music from this instrument it harmonizes itself with a grander instrument which is the earth right and earth mm -hmm. in a lot of stories is is symbolically represented by gods and goddesses you can look at it like a periodic table in chemistry having different colors and codes and having different energies given to everyone properties given to everyone so Maruts are your ocean uh, wind currents and your Vasus are your or ocean currents. Adityas are the sun rays and they all have different colors and they together form this algorithm which tells you how does the earth work to begin with and how you're already aligned with it that you may not know it, but you're already, you know, you're inhaling what the tree is exhaling and the tree is inhaling what you're exhaling, which is carbon and you're inhaling oxygen. So this is the great alignment. This is the great synchronicity, which some of these, you know, schools of thought are talking about. And the stories are usually about how this goes missing in somehow mm -hmm. humanity forgets this idea and it finds itself in a place of chaos. It finds itself in a place of conflict. And then perhaps the hero or those illuminated people bring this idea of harmony back into that place and find order after that. So most of the story kind of work around this mechanism. No, it's very interesting. In fact, uh, since we are short on time, I'll also take some of the questions that people keep asking me. Sure. So as you know, we are in this uh, time, uh, we don't need to discuss where we are, but a lot of people are, you know, in these stressful times experiencing depression, anxiety. And, you know, I've been told by, uh, you know, uh, artists like yourself that creative expression in any shape or form also helps in managing you know stress anxiety depression uh, these kind of tendencies uh, what is your advice and suggestion to people that how can they and i know that many of us are not trained or skilled enough to art or or, or paint but what kind of creative expression can can they resort to 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 relieve their inner thoughts and anxieties and and, and depression so I think what has happened that we have, this is a point of view I would share is that we don't have many things which allow us to create a relationship with silence and solitude. If you ask yourself a simple question of, do you have a relationship with silence when you're just by yourself? What no, happens? People are afraid that, of that. Yeah. yeah. So what happens that silence is very, it's a restless place to be in because you feel you become fidgety or you become right. slightly, you know, you will experience great amount of tremors. And the only thing, perhaps the only answer is that, you know, you do yoga or you go and do some meditation and you go and do something which is, you know, the spiritual kind of mm -hmm. uh, antidote to, to, to that chaos you're feeling in some way inside of you. Uh, you can actually, that's by aligning yourself with nature. That's one thing because Nature is a yoga shala. Let's look at it like that. When you go up on a mountain, what is happening? You are doing this. You're taking a long breath. You're holding it. You're exhaling it. So you're already okay. doing a kind of a pranayama as you go up the mountain. Same happens when you take a dubki, when you take an immersive thing in the pond, where you go down, you ex inhale, you go down, you hold your breath, you come out, you exhale, right? right? And you do this five, six times and automatically you're aligning yourself, but with that element, right? It's a ritual. That's why most of these rituals were designed like that. So what happens that we don't have a relationship with silence? So how can we create a relationship with silence? I guess, you know, bring in a little bit of a creativity and you don't have to look at drawing as something to draw something beautiful, but mm -hmm. drawing is the music of silence. You can look at it like that. Like if music is sound, it creates, you know, some level of harmonized noise if for a better way of speaking it. So drawing is that even if you take a simple, simple, uh, you close your eyes, mm -hmm. you take a piece of paper, 
Hmm. And then you take a pen or a or whatever you have, you draw a circle hmm. on it and align hmm. it with your breath slowly. And when hmm. you will open your eyes, you would have done something which looks like a jalebi or some kind of a thing like that. And now you can use your eyes as a GPS. You can move the line a little right, a little left, hmm. a little up, a little down. But hmm. engaging ourselves with something creative, whatever that might be, is a good first step towards creating a relationship with silence. Once we create that. i think then everything else will build out of that because chaos lives the most in silence if you do not go to chaos chaos mm-hmm. will always come to you and you will not know what to do with it so you make friends with chaos by making friends with silence in that way yeah and it's a very bold thought <laughs> yeah, and and what it does that it would move our attention from the materiality of the world because you know for instance you know taste only lives from your tongue like only around this this area the stomach right. does not un- recognize this taste right mm. so if you look at food and water and 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 breath mm. we don't focus a lot on breath we focus mm. a lot on food invariably that's the society right. we have become we don't actually so much focus on water and let and nothing at all on the breath for that matter of fact so i think that's one thing one can do i think you know and also writing a story like if you if you've had a hard day sometimes you know to come back and just to write about it and say that you know why did i why do i feel like this i think asking yourself a question that today i feel that i i i'm a loser or i i i maybe uh, sort of uh, i feel defeated you know or i i don't know where things are going or i don't know how what how to deal with this uncertainty so i think conduct a ritual for yourself write this down and say why do i feel like this why why am i feeling so wrongly about uncertainty because we have programmed mm-hmm. ourselves somewhere about comfort is good and non comfort is not good right mm-hmm. so each time it goes into a place where you don't want it to go where you you want projecting it you know numbers are not projected in the way you feel discomforted right but it may open up other possibilities you know it may open up a completely different way of even associating with people creating new bonds creating new possibilities for that matter of fact right and i'm going to take just last question in the interest of right. time uh, because our next speaker uh, anjum is also with us hi anjum uh, very warm welcome uh, last question thank uh, you so much hi anjum right. last question to you uh, abhi is that a uh, lot of people are saying that and and i can relate to them that many of us used to paint and draw as a hobby right and many of us uh, really wanted to pursue it in some shape or form but we all face a lot of resistance that you know like you know what kind of a, a commercial uh, opportunity would would be available for you if you become a professional artist i'm sure you would have also faced some of those challenges uh, you know in your family or in your society that you know how you going to make it uh, commercially viable uh, you turned out uh, to be uh, where you are but i'm sure you know that's like one in one in 2000 <laughs> who, who I... are able to do that But I wanted to be a right? neurosurgeon, so I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I wanted to go okay. into sports. Those were the two fields I was very interested in. Uh, so art was something I just would do for myself, and that's sorry. I, uh, complete your question, though. Then I'm no, no, but but that's great, right? I mean, most of us uh, wanted to do uh, like sports or art. We ended up in 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 commerce or business. <laughs> but you had option between sports and arts, and so you know you really followed your passion. No, but, but the thing what is, is your I'll advice do... to to people who who do not have that. Uh, I don't know what's the right word, but that luxury. Can they still uh, pursue their hobby, or is or, or do you think the scene is changing in India that you can be a professional artist or a graphic novelist and make a proper career out of it, and it's not like a side activity which many people say. Think uh, say, look, the thing is that the answer to that is very simple, at least from my point of view. One is bring creativity into anything you do. Okay. It, creativity is not exclusive to art. It's not something which you only find in art. Creativity is a much larger phenomena, and right. you can bring it into anything you do, from uh, cooking to management. I mean, like yoga, by the end of it, is a great exercise in management and harmony, and and you know, understanding how the structure of you know a human body is uh, is in tandem with the with the with the earth, and then with the universe, for that matter of fact. so bringing creativity into whatever you do and whatever and creativity means finding a sense of harmony finding us and being being more observant you know 
stopping in a world which where you're just glancing and fleeting, you're moving from one thing to the other. So giving yourself time. These are the tenets of creativity. And these are the principles of creativity which you can bring into whatever you do. That's one. And second, you know, like we all love music. We all sing when there is a function or on our own or in the bathroom. So you don't have to have the aspiration to be a professional musician to actually enjoy and sing or be or, or love music. It's the same with drawing. Just draw for the fun of it, for, you know, making your day into a story or creating a connection with your friends or with your children or with your own self primarily. And just do it without the expectations of becoming a professional because it's, it's a much larger phenomena than, so we can't just only, you know, bracket it in the profession of art, you know? So you can, the way we enjoy music in India, I think that's the same way we can enjoy art as well. You don't have to become a profession per se, but if that your path leads you to become one, then why not? And the path will tell you more than anyone else. <laughs> uh, with this, we're out of time. Thanks so much, yes. Abhi. And for me personally, I think the two key takeaways are, are one with just your closing statement that, do not really have any expectations, uh, just do it. And if it if it's bound to happen, if you're honest enough with yourself and what you do, it will happen. And and second is to journal down. So as you said, many of us have these feelings at the end of the day that I didn't do enough or I could have done more or I feel defeated, I feel like a loser. Do not get uh, have those feelings take over you, but like logically think about them, write them down and, 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 and analyze it. So I think these two are, are really powerful. Uh, make them into questions. Make your pressures into questions and make the questions into pursuits, you know? So pressure to pursuit, you know, that's the whole idea. That's the whole morphing of something which becomes, that's creativity in essence. Wow. Uh, thanks so much, Abhi. Uh, thank you. Really thank you, thank thank you, you for everyone. being with us. And, and uh, uh, people, you are more than welcome if your schedule permits to stay uh, for the session with, with Anjum as well. Yeah, well, uh, we would be more Absolutely. than happy to. And I just want to say you. thank you to Karthik, to you, and for arranging this, and to everyone who attended this, and to Anubhav, who, you know, uh, put my name there. And because of that, I'm here. So thank you, Anubhav. Thank you, Karthik. And thank you, everyone who joined. And thank you so much. It was lovely. Thank you. Now thanks, I'll join you as audience. Yes. <laughs> more than, uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, hi, Anjum. I hope you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very much. Very clearly. Hi, yes. good evening. Hi, good evening. So we are now ready with our second session with Anjum Chopra. And before I'm going to introduce her, I will show you a small video uh, about her. One second. I hope everybody can see my screen. The inspiration to keep going is uh, maybe the fact that I want to succeed in everything that I do. Success to me is a journey, not a destination. The idea is that if I have uh, set a benchmark for myself, first the target is to go and achieve that benchmark. The second target is to going and bettering that benchmark. Uh, guys, uh, she needs no. That's welcome. a lot of homework done. <laughs> <laughs> I do my job properly, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, I mean, I, you know, many of uh, the people have been uh, messaging me before the session. They're all, including myself, we're all been huge fans of, uh, you know, what, what you've done. And we're all so proud. And, uh, you know, and many of us have actually seen you play uh, in Firosha Kotla as well. And I know recently there was also a gate named after you. So we're all very proud of that. But still, uh, you know, Thank as you. my duty, I'm going to do a, a small introduction, guys. I mean, the complete introduction for Anjum would take half an hour in itself. <laughs> so I'm going to take the liberty of, of making it a bit short. Uh, but I'm just going to tell you that she's the one who has um, two things, if I can tell about her introduction. One is she, she for all we know, when we were all growing up, nobody knew women's cricket uh, or nobody took it seriously uh, when we were all young. And I think uh, only after Anjum and her, under her leadership, uh, players like Mithali Raj, uh, you know, we all started to, to understand what women cricket mm -hmm. is. And I think she, in many ways, put India on the global uh, women cricket uh, footprint. And, you know, she has got a list of the firsts which she has done for our country. She's the first woman uh, to have got honorary life membership of the Malibuan 
coveted Melbourne Cricket Club MCC at Lords. She's she's got Arjuna Award. She's a Padma Shri honoree as well. Uh, and she's the first to play six World Cups. Uh, she's the first to make a ODI century as a woman cricketer. She has been Indian cricket team captain. Uh, you know, she has broken so many records and and more importantly, so many glass ceilings, uh, which nobody thought was even possible uh, before she actually made it a reality. So uh, a very warm welcome to you, Anjan. We are so Thank proud you. of you, and Thank we are you, so Karthik. honored to have you uh, spending time with us. Thanks, Karthik. Uh, Thank you, know, you so much. And and Anjum, um, I know, I, I, and I'm sure uh, you would tell us a bit more about your of your life journey. But I mm. can't even fathom, or I think many of us uh, take it for granted when we read or or hear about you. But I think it's mm-hmm. it's unimaginable. I mean, twenty years back, or even further when. When you started your career, when nobody yeah. really thought that uh, women could play cricket in India, it was an, un- an unimaginable thought. How you sort of countered that entire, uh, you know, I'm sure you faced a lot of resistance, constraints. Although you came from a family of sports person, so yeah. may not be at a lot of pressure at home, but uh, you know, from uh, the the uh, administrative boards to to administration to you know your peers. Who might be mm-hmm. uh, taking up new creative career opportunities or or studying abroad? How did that feel to face all that pressure of expectations when people were choosing the conventional path, if I may say so, and you sort of took the uh, path less followed or less traversed and actually made it a success? But I want to know that early part of that journey when it was so hard and and nobody really believed that this could could be done, which you actually end up doing. So tell us a bit about that early part of your journey. So, uh, Karthik, it was very simple from where I see it today. I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm documenting it. So, you know, uh, what you say is absolutely right from where I see it today, um, you know, to, to live through that uh, journey, especially. And, and even today, of course, it's changed to a large extent today, but it's still um, still an early dose to have a woman uh, um, take, up a, take up sports as a career. So, uh, but I think when I, when I just look back and think, I think I just followed my passion because I wanted to play because I I was given the direction that if you want to go in a certain path, then make sure that you work at it and you are very good at it. Because look, I think it's it's very clear in our country that mediocrity has no value and mediocrity has no takers. So to excel, you obviously need to be good, but to be the best, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that you need to do in every sphere and every department to become the best because you can't become the best in your own mind. You need to become the best in the world. And for that, you have to start from home. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen just like that. It, it is years of hard work, persistence, being resilient, and uh, just believing in yourself. It doesn't happen. I, I mean, all these words are very nice English words that I'm able to use right. today. But uh, it doesn't happen. I think every day is a challenge and every day is a journey that um, you know you you live by it. Uh, and as a kid, you're just involved in that very present moment because you can't you can't have that kind of uh, wisdom or looking back and say, oh, you know, tomorrow is going to be a brighter day. That somebody else has to say that to you. You only thinking about the present, and it's like if the present hasn't been good and uh, the past hasn't been very good, like a previous day you've not scored well then your future is not going to show any uh, bright colors. So I think it's about uh, the other people around you uh, giving you the confidence, keeping you in that present moment saying, okay, it's gone. It's already history. Now let's go to the next chapter. Tomorrow's going to be a brighter day and keeping that encouragement going right through for you. Um, so fortunately for me, because that background, uh, that structure has been around, they know how to uh, lose a game. They know how to bounce back and win a game. Um, the discussions have been around as such, and and more so, I think the own uh, self belief uh, and and it grows. It doesn't happen. You don't you don't buy self belief, and you don't get it from anywhere. You have to cultivate it and you structure it yourself. Um, it, it's just going going by day by day, and just being there, and knowing that look, if if victory is your target, it wouldn't come to you. You have to go to it. And if uh, winning a world title is your is your target, then somebody else is not there ready to put the medal around your neck, you have to still bend down and accept that medal. But before accepting it, you still have to climb up those steps onto the dice. And it's not easy because you're not going to be welcomed onto the winner's stage. There is already somebody else and a lot many other teams and people 
vying for that same top honor right no it's a very insightful thought and you know but i've also seen and read about you is that you are extremely uh, you know a positive person and and in even in situations and i'm going to keep drawing some parallels with uh, you know what happens in management because many mm-hmm. times people think management only happens in the board room but i keep telling them that you could also learn uh, about management <laughs> from you know what happens on the ground in fact it's much more Uh, you know real time decisions have to be taken when you're on the ground you have got conflict resolution <laughs> negotiations you need to do politics everything happens uh, you know in a much profound way in sports right and people say no everything and it's quick decision making it doesn't happen it, you don't plan for it you plan exactly. for it the previous day and the previous night but what actually comes to you it has to be at that spur of the moment no and in fact you know uh, and many people keep asking me these questions as we are speaking tell us uh, uh, an interesting incident on the field when you know you had a strategy in place and everybody in the dressing room agreed that you know this is how we're going to do it and everything sort sort of you you thought everything is sorted and then you went and you know something out of the blue happened it rained on louis the court put was put in place or something like this which really made you think on your feet and you didn't have any backup plan in mind which so many times happen in in business scenarios right you have plan a b c and real, you realize that all of them are not going to work this time because either the enemy is different or the context is suddenly changed or a new variable has been introduced which you didn't plan for so have you encountered any such situation on the ground where despite all your planning it didn't work out and you had to think on uh, your feet yeah i think that the thinking on the feet uh, is part and parcel of the sport so uh, i think the very basic fact of sports is like you know people only see the finished product and right. what they see on television <clears throat> but right. sorry what they don't see is the uh, the behind the scenes and behind the scenes the footage is always what you're saying that you know you plan you identify and you sort your flaws out and you become a much better player but what actually happens in that match in front of uh, the millions and billions watching that is a completely different story uh, you might have heard a lot many players going oh you know everything went according to plan and mm-hmm. you know we always focus on the process and if our process is right we will reach the result so these are the key words which probably have been uh, drawn parallel from management uh, mm-hmm. field and put in together in terms of practically uh, doing it when you say process like i i i read about a subject called business process reengineering uh, during my mba days and i only know what the full form of bpr is you've done an uh, mba also you've not left nothing for us <laughs> mortals you've done all this in your life and you've done mba <laughs> which is one thing only management people have on their writing wall that you know we are an mba and you have done that also so um, yeah and, no and fortunately uh, you know i could manage to squeeze in uh, a, a regular mba so i didn't go to a working manager or a quick quick quick, quick one of a a year and four months it was a regular two year mba which i did from paul school of management in delhi because that's the only institute that gave me admission <laughs> in delhi otherwise i would have had to go out <coughs> sorry so um and and you know in that very year uh, that they introduced that if you want to specialize into subjects you can so like every brave kid all studious children i also put my hand up without realizing that to finish one subject specialization in one year was tough so add on to is going to be like a disaster especially when i was busy uh, playing my first world cup uh, during the year uh, i was in the mb uh, during the first year of mb so it was like okay. ending up doing 52 papers in a trimester system in like two years so that was like really taught me the uh, the um, the uh, technique of time management and mm-hmm. uh, whatever is that important just in time and it's like whatever <laughs> is important focus on that So right. if economics has to be studied, economics only has to be studied because uh, the the uh, the following day it's going to be organizational behavior. So don't focus on it because you don't know anything about it. Focus on economics on day one. <laughs> so you know a lot of these words have come out from the management uh, institutes only. But practically, if I without being biased, if I say that sports people use it every day, yes, they do it because you know we don't draw pie charts only. We draw pie charts only for that moment. We draw charts only to explain what has happened today on the ground. and we draw inference from it to imbibe that knowledge of what a practice session has been what the chart looks like what the numbers look like but how do we deliver it tomorrow and tomorrow is not a presentation tomorrow is an actual match where one ball right. can get you out and one wrong decision can cost you the victory 
so you know that's the kind of pressure that you incorporate it and you learn it and you move forward so yes those words are pretty much similar but the the reaction time is uh, very less right and and you know similar to uh, business processes or or corporate even in sports now you see a lot of technology is is being some yeah. people who are not pure, who are like purists of sport they say that it's just too much of technology you're analyzing and micro analyzing every ball every move you make as a player and you know there's so much of analysis which happens post match pre match then it sort of puts a, a player into a lot of uh, you know pressure some yeah. mistakes but it's also good right because you are able to then micro analyze your mistake yeah but how do you see uh, the role of technology and you know some of the players who who come from from different background who are not able to to sort of use some of these technology methods what is people who have got access to some of those tools which so happens mm-hmm. also in business right i mean yeah. you've got preferential access to certain uh, knowledge or information and we know that in sports people come from all over india from different parts of the world and yeah. you know how do you see that technology playing out do you think it's a overkill or how players are now able to sort of embrace technology in what they do i think the present generation they embrace technology even if they don't know it even if they don't study information technology uh, you know uh, the uh, the gadgets have become so very uh, user friendly that they just pick up any of the phones or any of the gadgets and they okay this is how it's used or or they learn it very very quickly from their teammates so usage of technology has become very easy and whatever um, the softwares the cricketers or any other sports people use i think they are very user friendly as well so i have always believed that you know technology is there for your health uh, technology is there to um, make you understand how better you can uh, use your own credentials to become a much better player for example how technology is used like you would know that uh, a bowler like uh, jasprit bumrah for example is is very good at bowling yorkers in the in the death overs or even the initial overs so you know that a yorker is going to be coming every second or the third ball so you prepare to facing a yorker but does it come on the second or the third ball that is human intelligence that's your own mm. uh, player uh, intelligence game intelligence that uh, gets you uh, the better of jasprit bumrah or the latter gets the better of you so uh, that 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 decision is always going to be there with the player but you can prepare better because you know a particular bowler bowls a particular kind of delivery very very well so you 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 change your stance or you are better prepared with your back lift um or you are uh, you know just taking a single and uh, going to the opposite end and somebody and asking some else to face the ball your other partner so technology helps you understand your opposition and yourself in a much clearer perspective earlier you couldn't watch your batting for example right. when you're batting in the nets somebody used to tell you that you know you're moving ahead quite early or you mo- you're moving back quite early or you're moving away from the line of the ball now i only had to um, imagine it or oh, moving away from the line of the ball all right mm-hmm. but now when you see the camera which is completely focused on the batter in front of you from where the bowler releases the ball and then you can from side angle from front angle you can break it down in parts and understand when when your coach says or you yourself can analyze oh you know i went too early or i went too late uh, to playing that shot that's where technology helps you and and that's what um, makes practice much simpler makes understanding of your own game much simpler so that way you can uh, imbibe a lot of technology but for me i still feel that you know you need to have a very clear mind you need to think between your ears you need to have a very clear understanding about your own game and you need to adapt to the situation very quickly so training and uh, technology go hand in hand but when you come to a match uh, contest or a, when you come to a world cup final all that preparation that you've done over the years uh, i think you need to have a very cool calm collected mind to uh, imbibe that pressure and uh, right. whatever learnings you've taken from um, the technology and your practice sessions uh, put it into actual practice <laughs> you know uh, i'm really interestingly i have realized that after politicians the people who face the most criticism is our cricketers in our country i mean practically whether after i mean you might have <laughs> <laughs> okay and sometimes even more than uh, politicians i think the players play our non covid days players play mm. more than the politicians play no <laughs> <laughs> so you know and and the criticism like i mean if we take you as a case study i mean the mm. criticism 
varied from uh, you know when you join as a new player that you know you have to perform well to when you take on more leadership as a captain then the responsibility is to win if you win then it's like why didn't you win the world cup and if you win a world cup then why didn't you win again and then you know when you get now yourself you getting into commentary into administration of side of the things i know a lot of people then spark debates around you know about equal pay and i know you were very vocal about this whole issue of equal pay and you candidly said that you know if we won the world cup yeah. if we win more obviously logically uh, you know equal pay would come into play so the criticism and this intensity is very is right for any player across yeah. their career but how do you i mean for a for an average person it's it's just sometimes too much to take because you've been doing everything right and you make one mistake or you know you sometimes you don't even make a mistake but people try to frame you into a criticism so how taxing is it i mean i know everybody puts in a brave smile and you know talks about it but tell us behind the scene how tough it is sometimes does it get to you you know sometimes it breaks you down that you know what the hell is happening i'm doing everything right but why are still yeah. people acting as they are an enemy yeah. So yeah. how do you handle that situation? I think it's uh, very draining. I won't say that uh, it's easier uh, for a sports person to handle it or easier for a non-sports person to handle it. I think it's every person to themselves how they take it. Of course, uh, for example, let's take the scenario that you mentioned that you know without a fault of you uh, actually conducting that mistake or without any fault of yours but you're actually framed into it. Yes, that happens. I have also been framed into uh, not one but quite a few <laughs> times but you know it's very draining because you're fighting the odds and at that point of time you realize that you're the or you're the only one who's standing outside the boundary line just to be more descriptive uh, for mm-hmm. the for our audience so you're the only mm-hmm. one who's standing outside the boundary line where everybody else is inside the boundary line and the game happens inside the ropes not outside the ropes outside the ropes right. you only prepare and you're only waiting but you're actually not been able to partake in the ropes uh, in the in the game which is happening inside the ground and irrespective of how much you want to shout and tell the world of your innocence it's like a glass shield you might be shouting but nobody is interested in listening to you either because they don't want to stand next to you and and uh, say that yes you're in the right corner or maybe you're not uh, making sense or you're not uh, reaching the right audience so uh, it, it, i think for everyone whether it is i, I mean any player uh, be the top notch player in our country or in the world everyone goes through it and that's why since a few years we are hearing about a lot of stories coming out about uh, players fighting depression film stars fighting depression and it it does happen because you start doubting your abilities no mm-hmm. no one ever in the world will not have a doubt about your own abilities be it at the start of the career during the career or even when they're at the top of their uh, marks you will you still have it but i think what sport teaches you what cricket actually teaches you is uh, playing that one ball at a time sometimes when you know that you're scoring you need to score 20 runs in the last over to win a match uh you can't score 20 runs on that one ball so it's like one ball game play one ball at a time because you miss that ball you and you get bold you're walking back to the pavilion so you're not an asset to the team in fact you've lost a ball as well so it's just that one ball game either you take a single go down to the other end get your partner score the 19 runs or divide it amongst yourself uh 10 each or either side or whatever or maybe just just wait for that loose ball to come from the bowlers so whatever it is play that one ball at a time because that's all you're going to get you're not going to get six balls thrown at you at once you will only get one try to make the most of that one delivery players like ms dhoni virat and everyone can hit a six of that one ball and get the equation down straight away to 14 which is very doable or players mm-hmm. like uh, others they just make sure they rotate strike and they keep rotating the strike good well enough to reach their target so that that technique of reaching the target of 20 is uh, everyone to themselves but what helps you um, in your uh, mental uh, development or keeping you in that fray at that very moment is that uh, one ball game so play that one ball be in that zone we'll think about the next ball after we've played the first ball and and break that down as well it's not okay oh let's play, let me play that first one ball i'll score a boundary it doesn't happen like that break it down even further so the when the bowler is about to run up you don't need to focus as a batter on the bowler runner somebody might have a very long run up somebody might be running from 30 yards so you don't need to focus on 30 yards right. because 30, right. the ball is not going to get delivered from the 30 yard Correct. ball is only going to get delivered when the bowler releases the ball which is practically going to be by the time it reaches you it, it comes down to it's it's within the 22 yards that i'm talking about so mm. you know it's from that distance and if you step out further you're reducing that distance from where the bowler is delivering to you 
So focus on that very moment, just before that bowler, just very fraction of a second, the bowler is about to deliver that ball and you're into your stance and that fraction of a second, the ball reaches you. So it's, it's that kind of focus. And then you're very aware whether the ball is going to the boundary. If it's not, can you convert that one into two or two into three? And then analyze after that delivery is, is done as to what is the equation. So it's being in that present to making it much more simpler for the audience. It's being in that present at that very minute or that. Very but you second. know, interestingly, you mentioned about this focus, and many people also asking me that you know hmm. there is a pressure from the audience. That's one thing. But then sometimes also players get into sledging, which is now a very hmm. uh, you know fashionable thing. And and I think some of the players in our team also resort to such techniques. How, what is your take on that? Do you think it's really distracting? Do you believe in it? Do you think it's it's not part of that sort of gentleman, mm-hmm. gentlewoman play which it was all about? What is your take on that? Because we also Look, face the, the same thing in business, right? The absolutely. company is doing dirty tricks, right? So is is it fair? Is everything fair in 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 sports, or do you think it's it's one too much? See, sports is supposed to be fair, and it is fair. Um, I think sports is the biggest leveler uh, that you can ever find because. Look, let me put it in the other way around. You're not going to the ground to be well received by your competitors, because you're not giving them a welcome either. Way. You know, it's competition, and in a competition, everything is fair, and it is as long as you're not getting personal. You know, the 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 question arises or the conflict arises when you start getting personal, and whatever banter's have come out, uh, or what whatever controversies have been created around the sport has only been because of people getting affected by personal banter. and mind you karthik it's not only the people who are around the hotel you people from outside uh, the boundary ropes also keep reminding you when you coming down walking onto the ground they keep reminding you and when you walk back up also they tell you what your scores have been similar okay. to what uh, you know when, when when if you walk into your office and you are about to give a presentation mm-hmm. and just by ch- by chance your computer doesn't work and say right. oh, okay that's that's a very good start to your presentation <laughs> oh you wearing a white shirt today i thought the memo was for blue so that's that's a that's a comment that's a sledge in 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 the right. sporting field it's called a sledge in a in a corporate uh, environment it's called uh, a nasty comment so right. it's it's while you walk down the corridor oh good luck for your presentation <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm getting uh, memories from the light <laughs> right and you know like, uh, yeah. and you what know. did that actually <laughs> learn uh, because it's competition right No, absolutely. And I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience as well. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. interest of time, so mm-hmm. people are saying that you know, mm-hmm. and then they, they knew, and IMA members all, uh, yeah. you know, pride themselves on being management professional. They are saying you have taken MBA lessons into sports without telling anybody. That's the secret which is revealed now. So when are you sharing your learnings from the sports back to the management fraternity for our benefit? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. Uh, if you want to uh, hear that. uh when the lockdown opens up then i'm sure uh, we can we can organize that session uh karthik if, if okay. uh, you you really want to uh, have that otherwise uh it can it will reach uh, <laughs> your uh, coffee tables uh, pretty soon it will happen in uh, next year only by 2021 where it will reach the coffee tables you're coming up with a book <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay that's interesting and uh, the last question is how do you see i mean everybody saying this two shall pass and 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 the whole positive mm. vibe around it but do you mm. think it will fundamentally in some way change the nature of sports and that whole energy of people thronging and and crowding in stadiums cheering for their teams do you see how far we are from restoring that level of uh, you know people getting together and watching mm-hmm. a match in a stadium and shouting or do you think with time in the near future or maybe in 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 mid to long term people would be more comfortable uh, you know watching it uh, from their homes experiencing social distancing or do you think in this is just a phase it will pass and we'll all be back to our crazy self i i don't think uh, humans are really created to uh, you know have a social distancing being practiced <laughs> i don't think mm-hmm. it will take some time for uh, us to realize that what social distancing in as and what uh, cleanliness and maintaining healthy environment is um i think the day the lockdown opens up we'll see a complete change um meeting people suddenly we've been meeting people uh, having an interface right. like this suddenly when we see so many people on the streets we might just get scared of the whole thing <laughs> and 
but yes, if if uh, for the moment if the crowds are not allowed into the stadiums and all these reasons are actually practiced, then yes, it's it's definitely going to make an impact, and it has made an impact. It's made an impact in the corporate world. It will make an impact in the sporting fraternity as well. But we can only hope uh, and pray that as we go along, uh, you know, things start becoming uh, much more uh, better or start getting controlled in a much nicer manner. That we are uh, back to uh, living in a much more cordial environment. So you know, leave out what all bad things were supposed to be left out, like uh, respecting environment. Most importantly, let's let's learn to create uh, that uh, more frequently within our system. So a lot of good things. Let's imbibe that, and then when we move forward, I'm sure it will take time. But I do feel uh, that it will all get restored. Great. Uh, with this, uh, we are almost out of time. and uh, thank you so much uh, anjum My for pleasure. taking out time i really appreciate it and i'm going to hold you on to your promise of of coming and spending time with us again when your book is launched uh, so that's the public news now you have shared with us <laughs> <laughs> is the title decided but make sure no no, no. make sure it's not title is not decided i mean i will be okay. sharing all this information it's still okay. in the pipeline it's still too okay. far away so probably this is the first time that i've ever uh openly spoken about it but yes it's in the pipeline and um, it does take time to document it it doesn't have to even think of one match and uh, write about that one match it takes uh, nearly half a day or sometimes a day to just complete those two pages <laughs> believe me it's a, <laughs> you might have played it in your mind but right. when you actually put uh, it down uh, when you put pen to paper or you put uh, <laughs> the effort of right. typing out it does take time it doesn't happen quickly <laughs> No, I'm sure it will come out soon, and we'll all. So let's keep it. A, let's keep it still a secret. When I when I'm there, uh, then you'll have it on your coffee table, as I said uh, later. But till that time, <laughs> sure. we'll have an interface like this. This is better. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you so much, Anjum, for for My coming pleasure. again. Uh, uh, we are so privileged to have you, and thank you everyone who joined us in for this session. And we hope to see you uh, in our next session uh, on next Friday. But till then, stay safe, stay at home. Uh, Have a great evening ahead with your family. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.